the best thing that I could do as a curator is put a, a strong grouping of works together that help spark associations for people. I mean, there's, it's endless in terms of the, the possibilities for interpretation and the connections that you can make. contemporary art, uh, especially because the artists were alive and I got to meet them and I got to know them and it was a very um, interpersonal kind of intellectual experience. As a child I loved making art. I was a maker until uh, I graduated college and for a while I thought I was going to be an artist. I took the first job I could get working as a youth outreach worker in the city of Boston. So I was working with inner city gangs. Don't I look like I was someone who worked with inner city gangs? Um, I loved doing that too because it was real and uh, it was meaningful work. But I was always looking for jobs um, in the art world. And there seemed to be a tremendous amount of opportunity here uh, to really energize the contemporary program at the IMA in, in the city of Indianapolis in the state of Indiana. And I came in in the fall of 2008 too, and uh, it was an amazing opportunity, a beautiful, beautiful institution and grounds. I am the second curator to oversee the department. Um, compared to most encyclopedic museums in the United States, this is a very young department uh, for contemporary art. The period that I oversee is from 1945 to the present. So compared to some curators, that's not a very long period of time. And so when you make uh, a decision to acquire something for a collection, it's very complicated, obviously. It's not just like a snap decision where you're like, I'll have one of these and I'll have one of those and I'll bring it in and it'll be great. I mean, you really have to think about it. You also, when you're building a collection, have to think about what you already have. Basically, you know, contemporary art can be painting, it can be sculpture, it could be installation art. Um, it can be photography, uh, video, there are lots of different possibilities for it. Sometimes it's representational, so it's identifiable, figurative, landscape, something that, that is easily understood, uh, and, or it can be abstract. So for example, this um, string, this diagonal string is a work by Fred Sandbeck. It's a piece that really pushes the envelope for a lot of people. Sometimes it really irritates them, sometimes it fascinates them. But what happens with the piece is it really becomes a drawing in space, and then it also becomes a sculpture in space. This is a, a piece by a very famous artist, Richard Tuttle. In a way, it's like a deconstructed painting. And then this piece um, was a much later piece that is, is by an emerging artist, Gabe Piankowski, and he bought a ready-made canvas and then obsessively unthreaded the entire canvas and then paint, repainted each strand of the canvas by hand. This is a new installation and this was a way of hanging work in relation to one another that would comment on sort of calling into question what is a painting or what is a drawing um, and doing that uh, through abstraction. A landscape architect um, and designer the other day who said, I believe that landscape architecture has the power to change the world. And, um, and I was like, I know you, I recognize you, because I'm the one who says, I believe that contemporary art has the power to change the world. And I, I really do believe that in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, it's not going to save lives ultimately, but I do believe that it helps create uh, deep, uh, creative thinkers and I think that if we have deep creative thinkers um, who are also ethical 
in this world, we have more people like that, then we can solve a lot of problems that we have. And art is one means of, of pushing that further.